just before we begin, uh, just a reminder for people uh, on Zoom uh, that if you'd like to start your video uh, so we can see each other, uh, you're invited. So again, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, just to let you know that uh, there's a good number of uh, members and some non-members who are involved in a, uh, a weekend-long retreat with uh, Brian Hindert uh, this morning, this morning uh, simultaneous to uh, this talk on another Zoom line. <laughs> so, uh, before uh, I begin the formal talk this morning, uh, I want to uh, take a little time to do something that uh, we used to do uh, more often, but I realize I haven't done in a while, uh, which is to take questions, uh, both for people in the hall and for people uh, on Zoom. People in the hall can ask uh, directly and uh, same uh, online. We can, they don't need to chat. They can just unmute themselves. Uh, again, uh, we uh, study the Dharma, we hear the Dharma, uh, we read the Dharma, uh, we reflect on the Dharma, uh, and then we practice. And uh, we want to have them all uh, very congruent uh, so that our uh, understanding of the Dharma intellectually and our ability to practice it, and most importantly, to integrate it uh, is seamless, uh, but it often doesn't go that way. Uh, sometimes uh, we have trouble with some of the teachings we hear, we don't quite understand them, or uh, something else happens as we encounter them, uh, and we're not sure how to practice them. Or we may be practicing them, but they may not be uh, producing the results uh, we thought. So again, what I want to do is please take a moment for everyone, uh, just reflect, and to see if you have any uh, questions uh, in terms of uh, the teachings and the practice, not just an intellectual uh, sort of question, but something that, that uh, you know, has meaning to you, uh, both in terms of, again, your understanding of the teachings, uh, your understanding of how to practice, but most importantly, uh, applying the practice, bringing the practice, integrating the practice uh, into our daily life, uh, so it makes a difference. Why else practice? Uh, and while, while you're reflecting, uh, I'll just announce that uh, next Sunday, uh, a member uh, who I believe most of you don't know named Gary Hammond will be giving the talk uh, and it'll be a mind seeking the way talk. Uh, we've had a number of those over the past uh, year or two and they're really uh, a very meaningful talk because what the uh, member does is they talk about their life but in terms of uh, the mind that seeks the way kind of acknowledging uh, through everything they've been through in life, um, often from childhood, there's been something else going on, something else deep inside themselves that knew there was another way, a better way, a way not to suffer, just, just a higher calling in life. Uh, and we call that uh, the mind-seeking way. And so Gary, again, most of you don't know, uh, he really does not attend retreats or intensives. Uh, he lives here in Florida, but he and I have a strong personal connection. Uh, I always, when I think of Gary, I think of uh, Johnny Cash, 
uh, in many ways. <laughs> he shares uh, uh, a lot of similarities. Uh, and Gary also uh, recently uh, received the diagnosis of terminal cancer. Uh, so he's dealing with that. So I want to, uh, so I invited him uh, when we talked recently, uh, would he do it? And he was quite happy to. Uh, so hopefully he will, he will be with us next Sunday uh, because he is a, anyhow, hopefully he will be with us next Sunday. So uh, having said that, uh, I'm now open to taking questions, uh, both from people in the hall. Uh, there's a, a mic or something. Maggie on the mic, and uh, or if you're at home, just uh, unmute yourself, and uh, you'll be you'll spotlight them, or how does that work? Okay, Ma I'll I'll leave it to Maggie. So if you have a question, please bow in and ask a question in the hall or on Zoom. And again, remember, you have to unmute yourself, which is down the bottom of your screen. Christine bowing in. Yes. Hi, Fred. Um, Hi. I have a question. I've been taking, I've been um, thinking about the I, me, and mine. And I, and, um, I was wondering, I was just thinking about an object that I owned and it occurred to me that I don't own anything. <laughs> Can objects be owned? <laughs> you know, I, I, it, was, it was just like a rock and I'm like, well, I don't really own that rock. Mm -hmm. And I am, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm something and that's something, but I don't. And then so, all of a sudden I started thinking yeah. about everything else. Yeah, so I, hold Hold on to that, Christine. That actually was the topic of what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Oh. Uh, whether I get communion, I don't know. But uh, so just hold on to that one. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Other questions? Question in the hall. Good morning, Fred. Good morning. You're okay. gonna have to speak up a little bit because of the muffleness of the mask. We've learned that. Okay. Is this? I guess so. It's really for the Zoom. And yeah, just you do your best. So my question has to do with afflictive emotions. Mm -hmm. And what seems like very different instruction from Shanti Deva and Thich Nhat Hanh, mm -hmm. things that I've been studying of late. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that's the Shanti Deva. It's it's um, it's the enemy to be, you know, to be crushed. In in and then in Thich Nhat Hanh, it's it's take your anger and hold it like a baby. A mother holds a baby. And I've been sort of trying to work through, you know, trying to do both end. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but the, the Shanti Deva way feels very much like spiritual bypass to me of mm -hmm. not letting it in at all. Um, mm -hmm. Having the gatekeeper at the, at the gate and it doesn't get in whatsoever. And, and just, you know, and it, and Thich Nhat Hanh is like, well, take it in completely and hold it. So uh, I've been trying to practice with both of those. Yeah, yeah. And, and and just looking for some some guidance. Yeah, so that's uh, you know that's good. This is this is sort of the problem with Buddhism not being a uh, a uh, a dogma. You know, that, you know this this believe in this, do this, this is it. You know, uh, as you see, and and this is also uh, historically the way the Buddha taught. And historically, the teachers have taught that way ever since, which is, you know, we, we all want to get to the same end result, such as, you know, we want to have a mind free of all uh, afflictive emotions. Uh, 
We'd like to have a mind of only wholesome and positive emotions. Uh, but how do you get there, you see? And, and uh, you know, according to the person, according to the situation, uh, the Buddha may say one thing to one person, and the next person may come in uh, right before him, you know, a day later, and he may say something different. And if you will happen to be there for both talks, you go, hold on a second. <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, so again, in, in Buddhism, that's called, uh, in terms of teaching and practice, the, all teaching and practice has to meet uh, the criteria of appropriateness and skillfulness. Appropriateness means uh, the teaching is appropriate to the situation, appropriate to the person, appropriate to the problem or whatever. So that's first criteria. Second criteria is being skillful. Whoever is doing the teaching, are they skillful? Do they have, are they skilled? Uh, that's the art, we, we might say, of, of, of working with somebody is, you know, to be skillful, to, to, to find you know, you know, what is the skillful response uh, to a student? Uh, so there you go. So you have Shantideva. Uh, Shantideva was in a tradition uh, where, you know, it was very simple, right? We, we want to, as uh, uh, expeditiously as possible, uh, attain awakening. We want to, as quickly as possible, attain a, a totally wholesome mind. What gets in the way? All the manifestations of self, which manifest in uh, not only distorted thinking, but in afflictive emotions, right? And so they are impediments. They get in the way of. Get in the way of what? Getting in the way of our, our developing this wholesome mind. And because as Shanti Davis says, and, I, and if you remember that chapter, he says, you know, he, he, after he goes, they're the enemy, <laughs> your afflictive emotions, your enemy, you know, they, 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 they only uh, are, you know, are doing you harm. They only, you know, you know, why do you indulge them, right? Why do you let them in? So after that, going on for pages and pages quite strongly, if you remember in the last page or two, he goes, but hold on a second, you know, an enemy, and this is back in, you know, 8th century in India, an enemy has real swords. You know, you know, they can really hurt you. Your afflictive emotions don't have thoughts, swords. You know, they can't hurt you at all. Why are you making such a big deal? They're really, there's nothing there. And then I think toward the end of it, he just talks about how, how you know, afflictive emotions and the self that's experiencing are essentially empty of any solidity or right. So, so that's his way. Uh, now again, <laughs> spiritual bypassing is a is an American concept. That's American Buddhism because we are uh, we are uh, you know in our in our psychological culture uh, you know we're very attuned uh, to our psychological states, especially our our unhappy ones, and. Uh, and we want to deal with them, why? Because we're, we're in the mess, you see. Shantideva wasn't in the mess, was he? He was, a, he, was a, he, he, he was a renunciate. He didn't have relationships, he didn't go to work, he didn't have family members to deal with. <laughs> he didn't have politics, you know, I mean, he didn't. So, I mean, they were in a, can you see the very different world where there really was no reason to have an afflictive emotion other than you were just clinging to self, right? So the idea of spiritual bypassing, if you talk to Shanti David about it, you say, what are you talking about? You know, of course I, I want to bypass afflictive emotions, you know? because they have no root, they have no substance. And if I totally transform my mind in, into a wholesome mind, they will just wither, they will die, okay? Is that true? Absolutely true, okay? Over here, you have Thich Nhat Hanh, right? Comes out of a Zen tradition, right? A very traditional tradition. Encounters the modern world encounters the West, encounters what's going on. What does he find? 
No, no, it's, it's, see, when Shanti Deva calls the afflictive emotions the enemy, it's because he doesn't identify with them at all, you see. We identify with our afflictive emotions, you see. You see the fundamental difference? We think they're me, right? So, uh, and, and we don't like them. But re what it really means for most of us is we don't like that part of ourself. You see, we don't like the part of ourselves that's angry or greedy or lustful or, uh, you know, uh, has shame or guilt, you see? You know, so, so, so what a number of the, of the teachers uh, who came over to the West from Asia who, who were perceptive realized that when Americans went the Shantideva route, they were spiritual bypassing, you see? Because these, these identification with their afflictive emotions was very strong and very painful. And they thought, well, I'll just go around them. <laughs> but, you know, to go around them takes a certain degree of depth of practice, you see, and understanding of the Dharma and meditative experience like a Shantideva or like somebody following that path. But most, most of us in the beginning of our practice when our emotional afflictions are so strong, don't have that strength. And he saw how again, how, how, how alienated and disassociated people were from their emotions. Okay, so therefore, what does he teach? <laughs> now he, Please, if you, if you, I mean, Thich Nhat Hanh, and it's often I've, I've talked to people who, who hear these teachings, you know, years go by, decades go by, and they're still, you know, hello, my old friend to their afflictive emotions, you see. And my point is, no, you know, we want to free ourselves from our afflictive emotions. It's, it's the same Thich Nhat Hanh's end game, and uh, forgive me for talking that way. Thich Nhat Hanh's endgame and, and uh, Deva's endgame are the same, but he has a different way, right? Because he understands the, 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 the psychology of the Western mind. So he says, embrace them. You know, call your enemy your friend. So, but what, really, what is he saying? So I acknowledge them that they're part of me. Right. But then what does he say? He says, you know, hold them in mindful awareness, which means you don't feed them. You don't identify with them. Right. You, you hold them in awareness. You're present to them. You just let them be. And then you look deeply into them. Right. Why? So you can liberate yourself from them. I mean, does that sort of answer your question? So, you know, so when people come to me, it's really kind of where you're at, you see. Uh, you know, if you're somebody who's really never acknowledged, you know, that side of you, right? Kind of walled yourself off or cut yourself off. Do not, it sounds strange, do not have a wholesome relationship with your unwholesomeness, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, then, then that teaching is good. But if you're somebody who, 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 who doesn't go down that, who hasn't gone down that road and is fully open to, to their mind and their positive and negative, you know, I mean, we often talk about, you know, my dark side, my shadow side, you know, these are kind of our concepts. Uh, you know, then, then there's a different way of working with them, right? And, and they're actually within the Buddhist tradition other ways of working with them. Um, so, uh, besides even those two, uh, so again, I would, does that answer your question? I mean, it's really, you know, the end game is the same. We, we, we want to be liberated from our suffering we, and our suffering a lot is created by uh, our emotional affliction. So, uh, the important thing that it work, you see. Now, again, again, for somebody who's really not in touch with themselves or very, uh, uh, you know, uh, separate from uh, their emotions, then obviously learning to be with your emotions, like just be with them 
know, it doesn't, you know, they're just emotions. As Shanti Davis says, which is true, you know, they can't hurt you. <laughs> they don't have knives. They don't have, you know, they're just, they're just feeling states. You know, if you learn just to let them be, you can just label them, you know, the, the simplest thing is, I am aware that there's fear in me. I'm aware that anger has arisen in me. I'm aware that there's sadness in me. And if you can hold that without going down the rabbit hole, you see, we go down the rabbit hole with them. Right? We follow that white rabbit right down into the hole, don't we? Don't follow, don't follow down the hole. See the white rabbit. Know what the white rabbit is. Just let it be. Okay? Thank you, Doc. Uh, any, any other uh, questions? Somebody chatted in a question. That's, you know, you know, if sometimes people have questions that they may not want to be publicly identified with, so if you want to chat them in, that's fine too. Yes, Maria. Does Dharma teaching have a perspective on suicide? I have had family and friends who exited this way. I'm currently extending comfort to a family member who has a recent loss and who is young and follows Buddhism. I want to help alleviate his suffering in this if I am able. So I missed the connection with suicide. Is, are they saying that they're this friend or family member that they're counseling is, is suicidal or made, has made a suit. They've lost somebody, okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, so suicide is what? I mean, when, when I used to be a mental health professional, uh, it would, it would say, you know, it would say uh, suicide is a long-term solution to a short-term problem. What is the short-term problem? That somebody is stuck. I mean, really, it's as simple as that. Somebody is stuck in suffering. Right? And they uh, want out. And so therefore, uh, not living uh, seems a way to uh, solve the problem of their suffering. Uh, but again, uh, all psychological problems, all emotional problems, have solutions. Every mind state is workable. So when somebody has worked themselves into a dark place where they feel whatever their experience is unworkable, yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, tragic and dangerous place for somebody uh, to get into. You know, traditionally in Buddhism, Buddhists believe in what? believe in rebirth, believe that the, there's a continuation of consciousness. So the idea that somehow uh, taking one's life is gonna, is gonna you know, end their suffering, they wouldn't uh, consider because they would understand that the, the fundamental suffering of the mind uh, you know, uh, would, would just travel with them. I mean, again, you don't have to accept that. So I, so I think for, <laughs> you know, uh, and especially as Buddhists uh, fundamentally believe in not killing, not doing harm, and believe that uh, this life, whatever it gives us, is precious and an opportunity for transformation and waking up uh, to not acknowledge that, uh, that uh, opportunity that we all have, whatever our karma, whatever how it's unfold, we all have the opportunity to change, to transform, to heal. That is, that, is, that is the possibility of all of us. So that's, that's I would say in a very quick way, that's Buddhism and suicide. Having said that, you know, it's, it's, it 
it's tragic, it's sad. <laughs> I mean, what can I say when somebody takes their life? Because you know that their mind state when they took their life was absolute dark hopelessness. They had walked, psychologically, they had walked themselves into a corner. Not a real, there wasn't a real corner. Because there's always something that can be done. But they'd walked themselves into a dark corner where they didn't see any options. So that's sad. Um, I remember many, many years ago uh, when I lived in Naples, uh, somebody I knew, uh, their daughter, who, who was an adult, I think she was maybe in her 30s, uh, committed suicide. And this woman knew me and, you know, her family, <laughs> I think they were Catholic or something, but she, she, she invited me to, uh, to come to their graveside uh, uh, funeral uh, to speak to the family, who, who I didn't know. And, uh, and she told me that many of them were uh, angry at their sister, at their relative, because of what she had done. I mean, I guess she had had a history of, uh, of addiction and would do well and then would relapse. And, and uh, so they were, they were angry at her. And it's funny, I remember saying at the funeral, please don't be angry at her. She has suffered enough in this life. And, you know, she had enough anger at herself. More anger than she could bear. Please don't be angry at her. She, she at the end of it all, she was doing her best. But it's a moment uh, alone she got lost in her darkness, right? So, you know, I think my, my word to each other was, please be there for each other. And if you know anyone who is going through a difficult time right now, uh, please stay connected to them so they don't go down that, uh, you know, that, into that dark place. Uh, good, not good. So, any any other uh, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Mauricio, do you have a, a question? Yes, um, I, I I was hoping that you could elaborate a, or a distinction uh, between suicide and euthanasia in the Buddhist traditions. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, obviously I, I do distinguish between the two, and I think that's what you're getting at. Uh, I don't remember, you know, one of the reasons we have euthanasia in our, in our society is a lot because uh, our medical system has so many ways to keep people alive, right, even if they're suffering. I mean, I think traditionally most people, when they got sick, you know, seriously sick, they died. Right or people, you know, you know what I mean. The the exit was it was different. I think because we we have all these magical ways to to maintain, uh, you know, you know, the physical presence of someone without any concern for their psychological condition, uh, that, which means their level of suffering. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, euthanasia becomes uh, something people think about, and I can understand that. You know, I have I have counseled people to be honest with you over the years. Uh, who have had uh, terminal illnesses, uh, terminal illnesses that, uh, you know, involve uh, significant uh, end of life pain and suffering. And they've, they've said to me, you know, when, when it gets to the point where the whole quality of life is gone and the suffering uh, is just intense, uh, you know, I think usually they would say they've saved pills or something, you know, I think that's often the, the usual way. Is that all right? And I would say, of course it is. 
you know, this is, this is not suicide, right? This is, suicide is something very different. When Thank someone you. is, okay, when someone is suicidal, you know, they still have a life ahead of them, right? Uh, that's what I said. It's a, it's a short-term solution that has long-term consequences. Uh, well, well, euthanasia is really uh, end of life. And uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, quality of life, clarity of life is good. I mean, obviously, uh, yeah, so this is, this is what I would say. Thank you, Mauricio, for that clarification. Yeah. So what am I... Uh, uh, kind of wrap up the questions and answers for the moment, and let's move on to Christine's question. So interesting enough, uh, for those you on last week, uh, uh, because I'm involved in the wisdom intensive, I, uh, I, I based the talk on some, uh, some verses from uh, the Changpa, uh, the, the text we're using in our wisdom intensive. And so this week I, uh, I emailed uh, Ken and Betsy, uh, who are uh, leading the, uh, the Dharma intensive deconstruction of the myth of self, uh, to say, do you have any uh, little uh, pith teachings that uh, you know may be in, in, involved in your intensive that uh, that maybe I could comment on? So I got back some good stuff. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, so, so, I mean, really, that's what uh, I think, Christine, you were getting at. You're going, hold on, is this self that I'm so identified with and that thinks it has all these things, you know, what, you know is it real? <laughs> what am I doing here? Uh, so you're not the first person to ask that question. Uh, the Buddha asked that question. And, uh, and you know, the, the issue of self is central. Buddhism, why? Because the issue of self is at the center of the cause of our suffering. Again, the Buddha was, uh, you know, he was not a philosopher. He was someone who awoke from the world of suffering. And he realized that uh, Everyone has the capacity for happiness, for wholeness, to be free of suffering. And that, that is why he uh, taught. And so, uh, you know, in the Four Noble Truths, he says there's suffering and there's the cause of suffering. So when you look into what's the cause of my suffering, uh, you know, we may have a whole uh, plethora of uh, sufferings <laughs> uh, that, that we may uh, say that we experience. But, you know, if you go deeper and deeper and deeper, what's underneath that? And, and underneath it all is this strong identification that I am me, that I am a separate thing. And that the world and everyone in it and the things in it are outside of me. And so uh, whether, whether one identifies uh, with me as real, solid, and self-existence, or whether one knows that it's really empty of any solidity or self-existence is very essential. Uh, so uh, one of the things uh, that Ken and Betsy sent me was uh, something from Chandra Chandrakirti, who was a great uh, Indian uh, master, you know, from 1500 years ago or so. So this is a little verse. He says, first, we conceive the I, this is, I, you know, and grasp onto it. Then we concede the mine, like mine. You know, first we identify I, and we grasp, we attach, we identify with I. Then the I creates a mine as it looks into the world and clings to all the things of the world as mine. Like water trapped on a water wheel, we spin in circles, powerless, right? So he says, you know, once you've done that, and we've all done that, once we fundamentally identify ourselves as a separate, self-existent, permanent self, 
that looks out on the world and looks inward at all its thoughts and says, everything I see is mine or potentially could be mine. Like a water trapped on a water wheel, it just keeps going round. We enter what's called the world of samsara, the world of becoming, the world of birth and death, the world of change, the world of attachment and aversion. We just, and we just endlessly spin around, he says, like water trapped on a water wheel, we spin in a circle, powerless. Powerless, we feel powerless. Take a moment, is that true? <laughs> Close your eyes a moment and think. Think about the world of yourself and all its needs and its wants. all its attachments and aversions, all its stories about gain and loss. All its emotionality. Don't we just endlessly spin on the wheel of self? Powerless. Just take a moment just to reflect on what Chandra Kurti is saying to us across 1500 years of time and space. Is that true? Is it true for me? Is it true of the people I live with, my family, my friends, my colleagues? <laughs> when I think back of life, is that true? When I look out into the world and see what's going on out there, what people are doing and saying, is that true? Is everyone just spinning? powerless on the water wheel of self and me and mine, I mean mine. And then his final line of this four line verses Again, first we conceive the I and grasp onto it. Then we concede the mind and cling to the material world. Like water trapped on a water wheel, we spin in circles, powerless. And then he says, I praise the compassion that embraces all beings. What an interesting line to put after the other three. Right? Like out of nowhere he goes, I praise the compassion that embraces all beings. This is this compassion that embraces all beings is not is not our usual compassion. Right? I mean we think a compassionate act is anything that anybody does, right, to help somebody even in the littlest ways to help help them, to reduce their suffering, make life less difficult. We, 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 we label that uh, compassionate actions. I praise the compassion that embraces all beings. So he's talking about a very specific kind of compassion, a compassion that is based on the prior three. It's not our ordinary compassion for all the ills and the problems and the difficulties and the challenges and all the things that everyone in this world is concerned about. It's a compassion of the, of the awakened ones. And we all have the power to be awakened. Their compassion is a compassion that has, it is not, it is broken out of the world of I, me, mine. It no longer identifies with the I, me, mine, the small self. 
it sees how people's identification with the I, me, mine is just keeping them spinning on the wheel, and yet there's no reason for it. They can free themselves, right? So the, the compassion that embraces all beings is a compassion that sees this fundamental suffering of human beings and wants to free them from that, you see. See, because most of our compassionate actions, while they are helpful, you know, to feed the hungry is good, right? To uh, give sentient beings uh, shelter and safety is good. To create a more uh, fair and just uh, society for everyone is good, you see? And yet, with all that, if this fundamental problem, which is really driving the suffering of beings is not dealt with, it will continue. So, I praise the compassion that embraces all beings is really uh, uh, calling upon us who hear this message to say, is that what I wanna do? Do I wanna liberate myself from this fundamental misperception because what, what's he saying? It's sort of like Shanti Deva saying, you know, these mental, these emotional afflictions, they can't hurt you. They don't have knives. They don't have swords. He says, first we conceive the I. Could that be that at its most apparent the I thought, the me thought, the mind thoughts, are just words. It's just linguistics. It's just something we make up and that we grasp at it as if it's true and then we apply it to everything. Is that really what's going on? Is it really that simple? And that that fundamental understanding that that's what's happening and a re-identification, <laughs> a, re a, a, a re-dedication that is not uh, based on this fundamental identification as a separate me, but perhaps as a we, as a you and me. And even that's conceptual. So, so let's, let's just go on. Because uh, then they sent me some more stuff from uh, Eckhart Tolle. They're, the book is The New Earth, right, A New Earth. I think that was his second or third book after The Power of Now or, yeah. So Eckhart Tolle, everybody knows him. And if you read him, I mean, I've read him. It's been a while, but uh, it's like, oh, it's Buddhism. <laughs> uh, so it's all very, or most of it is very congruent. So uh, they sent me some quotes, so we'll take a look at them. Whether a child is rich or poor, whether the toy is simply a piece of wood shaped like an animal or a sophisticated electronic gadget, it makes no difference as far as the suffering of loss is concerned, right? So the, the child who, who loses you know, if that's their main toy <laughs> and they lose it, or somebody has this very elaborate, expensive uh, lock, electronic toy, when, when both these children lose it, they both suffer equally. Okay? It doesn't matter. And he says, the reason why such acute suffering occurs is concealed in the word my, and it is structural. This unconscious compulsion to enhance one's identity through association with an object is, is built into the very structure of ego. So 
So this is, let me just, just stop and say, is this true? Is this true, uh, you know, in a certain way, does the suffering of somebody uh, who has billions of dollars and yet they lose uh, millions of dollars in some deal and they suffer, right? Or somebody who has hardly anything and loses uh, their money we might say objectively <laughs> there's a difference, but in that moment of loss, of suffering, of clinging, of not wanting, is it the same to both suffer equally? I'm not talking social justice here. I'm just talking just personal uh, suffering. Is that true? Why is that? That whether you're, uh, you know, you know, your little uh, shack burns down, or your uh, your 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 big uh, uh, ten bedroom home burns down, why do you feel the loss? Why do both feel the loss equally? Why? The unconscious compulsion to enhance one's identity through association with an object. So again, if, if, if the word I, me, mine are simply words that we identify and attach to experience and attach, right? Then what that means is essentially there really is not a solid, separate, self-existent self within any human beings, right? It's just a creation, so to speak. But <laughs> it's sort of like it knows it's just a creation, so it has to kind of find something solid, you see, to give it a sense of that I'm real. So how does it do that? It, 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 it grasps at objects and then when it brings it in and says, these are mine, it feels real. It feels solid, you see? Who am I? I'm all these things. All these things I've accumulated. That's who I am. I'm all these uh, successes. I'm all these failures. I mean, uh, you know. <laughs> I'm all these things. This is, they're mine, you see? And, and we, it's funny, you know, we think, and again, you know, we, I live, we live here on Nebraska Avenue, Center of Homelessness in, in, <laughs> in Tampa, but it's interesting. Buddhist monks and nuns are homeless. They, they choose to be homeless. Fascinating. They choose not to have anything, right? And yet why the society, the greatest fear that people have is what? To be homeless, right? Isn't that interesting? And we, and we look down on homeless people as if they're at the bottom, right? And yet Buddhist monks and nuns, they take a vow to be homeless, to wander about. Because the idea of not having things, I mean, I'm not just talking about the difficulty of living on the street, I understand that. But the idea of not having things, not owning things, is terrifying to many of us. Why? Because we identify with things. You know, remember the Buddha? The Buddha lived in a, you know, he had a nice big house. <laughs> he had lots of things. He had lots of status. He had lots of identities. He had lot, you know, he, you know, he walked away from it all. You know, everybody just were like shocked. How could he do this? somehow knew that these things 
because they were all impermanent and unstable, there had to be something else to produce happiness. And, and then he goes on a little later, he says, um, you know, how, how do you know if you're attached to something? So again, you know, it's, it's this attachment, right? This is, this is how we enter the world, how the self enters the world. It attaches to things, to people, to status, to, to uh, you know, all kinds of things, to people's perception of us, or how we perceive. So it, it's endlessly clinging. So he says, how do you know you're attached to something? How do I know that I'm really identified with self, right? He says, well, as soon as you lose it or you feel a threat of loss <laughs> and you become upset, anxious and so on, that's a, that, that, that shows you you're attached. Okay? So it's kind of a simple criteria and has a nice emotional quality. You know, if you want to know, you know, am I, am I attached? Uh, you know, am I, am I attached to my body being healthy? Well, imagine your body being sick. You feel comfortable? Am I attached to being alive? Uh, you know, I can't, you know, freely walk into the world of birth or death. I'm just, no. oh no, I don't, thought of dying, I get anxious, right? You know, think about the people in your life, think about the things in your life, think about your job, your, you know, if you, if you lost them or there was a threat of loss, are you at ease? If you're not, that means there's some degree of attachment. That's, that's not bad or good, you see, that's just a good criteria. Yeah, let me, let, and then he says something, uh, I think that's, you know, very Buddhist. <laughs> he said, as we have seen, having the concept of ownership is a, fric is a fiction created by the ego to give itself this sense of solidity and permanency, make itself stand out, make it special. And he says again, this is, this is I, I mean, I, I like his words. He says, since you cannot find yourself through having, however, you see, this is the problem, you know, even if you accumulate lots of things, right? If you, if you, when you go home, look around at all the things you have and notice, have I really been noticing them? <laughs> And you might find you don't even notice them anymore. They're just there, right? You know, you, know, you see what I'm saying? Or, or you might not even, you know, <laughs> the people you live with, relationships, you see, once you have them, they may not be that special anymore. Because I have them. So, since you cannot find yourself through having, However, there's another more powerful drive underneath that per se pertains to the structure of ego, the need for more, wanting, desire, needing, you see? So that is why even as we accumulate and have, that's never satisfying for too long, right? That's always replaced by what? Which is a more powerful drive, which is wanting, needing, accumulating, you see? You know, because when you get into the sense of having, you've accomplished it. Ego kind of got what it's want. It's, it's satisfied for a while, right? Whether it's a person, a thing, an experience, a pleasurable experience. All right, now I have it. Right? Now what? You see? Now what? It's like, you know, when you, when you watch, uh, you know, these movie uh, things, right? The one show you're watching hasn't even quite finished and already they're doing, they're telling you what? It's, it's in that little corner down there. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, again, I'm, I'm in awe of the sophistication of, of, the, of these uh, things. You know, it's like, you know, you go on YouTube for one thing and like, bum, 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 right out along the side, you see? Because what do they know? You know, I may have, I may have found the thing I was looking for, but they know the wanting for more is in the structure of self. It always wants more. So what does it give us? 
lots of more, <laughs> you know? I would imagine I could never sleep and there would always be, you know, more, something I could go to next. And the ego, you know, would just, it could almost be exhausted and it would still go, well, let's, you know, one more. What, what's that all about? We call it wanting. No ego can last for long without the need for more. Therefore, wanting, desiring, needing keeps the ego alive much more than having. The ego wants to want more than it wants to have. And so the shallow satisfaction of having is always replaced by more wanting. There's a psychological need for more, that is to say, more things to identify with. It is an addictive need, not an authentic one. Right? Because truly, not, not the I, me, mind, that tiny little mind that's always seeking, because it, because you know why? Because to experience the world of the uh, separate self is lonely, right? It's lonely. To experience the world of the separate self is to feel kind of empty, not in a good way. <laughs> like there's nothing, there's really nothing here of any meaning or goodness. Oh, 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 I don't like this feeling. I better go do something. I better go want something. What could I want right now? You see, and we, you know, you know, you know, what could I want right now? You see, think about how your mind all day is giving you things to want, giving you things to need, giving you things to do keep us busy. Because when it stops all that, when it leaves the world of, of wanting and needing, and it no longer, you know, and it's and the and the having the things don't give us anything. You see, sometimes people look around at their stuff and go, you know, <laughs> I once went to somebody's home and I forget what happened. I somehow I saw their closet. And their closet was filled with clothes that still had the tags on them, right? And I asked them, what, what's that about? And of course, it's all about what? It's all about needing, wanting, getting, and then having. But once you have it, it's like, so what? You see, there's just more clothes hanging in the closet, you see? And so we always need more. You look around, we go, mm. you know, when I put that color on the wall a couple of years ago, I was all excited, right? I really, right? But now that I have it, mm, maybe I need another color. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like endless. It's an addictive need, not an authentic one. But what's our authentic needs, my friends? Our authentic need is to feel whole. Our authentic need is to be at peace. Our authentic need is to be truly happy in a state of well-being, right? Our, our, our real needs are to come back to our interconnection with everyone. You see, those aren't egoic needs. These aren't self needs. Self, you can always tell self because self is always quantifying, right? Self is always grasping. Self is always in it for the short term. That's another way you can know the self. It's always in it for the short term. Right? It, it, it just grabs its pleasures. <laughs> it just grabs its successes, right? Even though they're all short term. Why? Because it knows it'll just keep on, right? As soon as that one's done, it'll go get something else. It'll go get something else. Right? I mean, that's, that's it's, because it's, it, it's not real. 
in Buddhism, we say it when we say the self isn't real, it's not that it doesn't feel that way. See, we, we kind of feel like there's a me here. But when we look into that, when we meditate on that, when we investigate that sense of me, well, for at least the 2,600 years of Buddhism, nothing solid or permanent has ever been found. Which is sort of proof that even though it may feel like there's a me here, upon investigation, it cannot be found. I'll do a little experiment. Everybody close your eyes. See, there seems to be somebody listening to the talk. That's for all of you. For me, there seems to be somebody who's giving a talk, right? That's the way we think. But if you try, if you look into your own mind to see where, own body mind, can I find that person who is listening? I don't think you'll be able to find anything solid or real or permanent. Just look yourself. You know, we, we say, uh, I'm meditating. That's a good one. You know, I'm, I'm meditating. I'm practicing full awareness of the body breath. But when you look for that, the one who we say is doing all that, can you find that? Just look and see. It doesn't mean it doesn't feel, feel like there's something because we've so identified with that for endlessly. I mean, child psychologists know that little children, infants, don't have a, a sense of self, really, in any kind of a structural way. It's something they develop. It's something they embroider and elaborate and build on. See, we call that child development. From another point of view, it could be uh, the opposite. All of us as young children might have been on to something very different about who we were. And then there's another little quote they sent me. And so a power comes into your life that is far greater than the self, than the ego. All that is required to become free of ego is to be aware of it. Since awareness and ego self are incompatible. Very interesting. Huh? Many of us think, oh, I got to, Kill my ego. Got to destroy this thing. It is such a pain, right? All it does is cause me suffering, right? How can I get rid of it? How can I kill it? How can I stomp it? How can I leave it behind? How can I get rid of this enemy? Shanti Deva would say. And then Shanti Deva says, in the next chapter. Mindfulness, awareness. All that is required to become free of ego is to be aware of it since awareness and ego are incompatible. Awareness is the power. Awareness is the power that is concealed within the present moment. This is all you need to know. This is how you can observe. So we need to observe, we need to be mindful, 
we need to be aware of what's arising in our minds. Again, whenever we feel uh, an afflictive emotion, whenever we feel uh, clinging or grasping or attaching or aversion, whenever we feel better than or worse than, Self is present, right? And so the more we are mindful and aware of what is arising in our minds, and when we are aware, you know, of of kind of wrong thinking, misidentification, primarily because it's causing us suffering, to be lost in the world of self, you, you can feel it because it's constricting. There's a constriction in the mind. There's a tightening in the mind. When, you're, when, you're, when self is absent, you feel spacious. You feel whole. There's a state of well-being in your mind. But when we're lost in the world of self, in the drama of self, there's drama. How about that one? There's drama. That's, uh, that's our word, right? So if there's drama in your life, self is present. Self's not happy with what's going on. Self wants things to be different, wants you to be different, wants other people to be different. That's all the drama of self. Remember we said it's wanting. One of the big things that self wants is it wants things to be its way. <laughs> it wants people to be the way we want them to be. I'll just do one quick thing, then we'll end. Uh, another quote they sent me, it's a little off, but I think it ties in with what I said. He says, in the early stages of so, so many so-called romantic re relationships, people go, I'll play who you want me to be, and you will play who I want you to be. Sound familiar? He says, that's the unspoken unconscious agreement. However, role playing is hard work. And so these roles cannot be sustained indefinitely, especially once you start living with the person. <laughs> Just stop a moment. Is there any truth to this? <laughs> What is commonly called falling in love is in most cases an intensification of egoic wanting and needing. You become addicted to another person or rather to your image of that person. It has nothing to do with true love, which contains no wanting whatsoever. There is another way. This is, this is our way, right? You know, our way is learning to cultivate true love, which is total acceptance of, the, of people and situations. We embrace them with understanding. We embrace them with caring, right? Not with wanting and needing, not with the, you know, role playing, as he says. That's true love. And that is, that's why we wanna, you know, get out of the world of self, get out of the world of emotional afflictions. So our natural ability to love and to accept and to be with uh, becomes the way we uh, connect uh, to this world. So good, so, um, so that's a little from uh, Chandrakirti, from ancient India, ancient Buddhist tradition of India, and from Eckhart Tolle, a modern He's still alive, right? Yeah, he's still alive. A modern American uh, who's taking one of these uh, very uh, historical, traditional ways of looking at the world and sort of putting them in kind of modern vernacular. So good. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we will stop here. And again, uh, next week, hopefully, Gary Cam Hammond will be giving the uh, Mind Seeking the Way talk.